All right, welcome to episode 26 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. Welcome, Liz Darval. Hello. Hey, Liz, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And uh, today we're going to talk about a competitive versus collaborative frame. Um, a sort of thinking where you think one person has to win, another person has to lose, versus thinking about the win-win. And we'll start off with that. Um, so what do you guys think about, like, right away when you think about collaboration versus being competitive? Mm-hmm. So I can tell you from my perspective, what I usually talk to my clients about is what you just mentioned before, zero-sum thinking. And so just to define for our audience, zero-sum thinking is the belief that there's a situation in particular where if one person wins, the other person loses. So sometimes that's obviously true, right? So sometimes you have situations where, let's say, if you gain a particular job or a particular position, right, obviously another person or other people won't. But the thing is, a lot of the times, there's so much in the world that we could sort of acquire in terms of us as kind of as a whole that it's not so it's not so that um, when it comes to particular positions that just because we lose one or we lose out on an opportunity that there won't be other opportunities. So the way that people kind of see it is they see it as this sort of big chunk that or this big kind of chunk of life that says that if I gain this one particular thing, right, that means I'm never going to or the or let's say I'm sorry, if somebody gains this particular thing that I'm after that I'm never going to get anything even close to it. So like an example of this is if this girl rejects me that that means that's it. I'm never going to get a girlfriend right so if i don't get this particular position i'm never gonna get a job that'll make me happy if this podcast doesn't work out i'll never be successful i'll never be happy so it's interesting that you say that <laughs> right because it sounds like that sort of competitive mind frame mm-hmm. is based on certain conditions being met in order to feel a certain way mm-hmm. whereas i would say to contrast that with like a collaborative sort of mindset you can just feel you can already feel good it's like a sort of uh, reverse of cause and effect Mm -hmm. for example like from yeah you can see how from like an evolutionary perspective the person who has the most Mm -hmm. usually feels the best and uses the least effort in order to you know uh to to feel good thing is if you took that and then you try to uh then think of it this way what if you already felt good and already felt like abundant like as if you had everything Mm -hmm. then you'd still be acting as if you had that status that the person from the competitive mindset is trying to gain things in order to Mm -hmm. to feel and um that's interesting because then it kind of changes your priorities if you see that this other way of doing things works there's also less effort involved and you you become sort of like less in your head like needing to control a situation Mm -hmm. And more Ooh, like, like present to the moment and uh, actually like merging with the environment, kind of tuning to the needs of like who's around you and stuff like that. Instead of in your head seeing how you're affected by things, reacting to this in order to appear this way or needing to control that to appear that way. Yeah. Things along those lines. Liz, what do you think? Uh, I think Alan brings up a really good point. And when you do have a more of a collaborative teamwork kind of mindset, it does take a lot of the pressure and onus off of you mentally. Uh, If you're going it alone, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you have all of that weight on your shoulders that if you don't get this, uh, this result that you want, and there's like, you know, there's, and there's always that very strict dichotomy is you're either a winner or you're a loser. Mm-hmm. And that kind of that kind of mindset is just is simply unsustainable. And it's not good for you and it's it's not good for anybody around you because we are uh, a tribal uh, species. Mm-hmm. And it's any kind of collaboration is what makes a society grow and thrive. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because I think like um, when we think of it, that we think of like life as this big sort of um, this kind of like jungle of scarcity that we have like very few sort of resources and that there are so many of us and that we have very few resources, obviously, for all of us. And so I think the sort of mindset is that we have to compete with one another for those resources. And so mm-hmm. Liz also brings up, I think, a really good point. So when we think of the, like, let's say when, if I understood this correctly, I think what you're saying is that when we put so much emphasis on a particular, let's say a particular outcome, and if we identify with that outcome, then it becomes us, right? That it becomes like yes. how we perceive ourselves, right? That, yeah, that's what I was thinking you were saying. So the thing is that when people perceive themselves 
in the sense of if they perceive their identity tied into a particular outcome. Like, let's say if becoming a doctor is the thing that'll make you happy, you think, right? Becoming a lawyer, um, let's say having a successful podcast. If it's like this all or nothing type thinking where I'm either successful and I have this particular outcome or let's say I'm a loser and I don't. So obviously what's going to happen is you're going to be super depressed most of the time because you don't have the outcome and you're going to be super anxious because obviously the fear is that, oh my God, if I don't get this outcome, it's going to be devastating. And Mm -hmm. so a lot of times what I find is that with people that they put so much emphasis on one, let's say particular person or one particular thing. And then they think like, if I don't have this person, right, if I don't date this particular person, I'm going to be miserable. If I, again, don't have this particular job, I'm going to be miserable. And yet we kind of forget that there's this sort of ideal of, um, I guess, a sort of communal ideal of happiness that in a sense that happiness doesn't necessarily come from the fact that we gain the things that we want. And sometimes people aren't even happy when they gain the things that they want. They don't. They try getting what you want. You're not going to, yeah, you're not going to feel, uh, it's the happy. journey instead of the end result. Yeah. Essentially. I, and, then, uh, mm-hmm. and there's, you know, if you're, if your one goal is to become a doctor mm-hmm. and that's it, you know, uh, there in life, there are countless possibilities and you're tying your eternal happiness based on one singular outcome mm-hmm. when there are countless possibilities is so self-limiting and you're essentially setting yourself up to fail because once you do become a doctor, then it's going to be like, okay, like my next step is, you know, going to be like a, you know, a chief surgeon or whatever. And you're always going to have an upper tier and you will never be happy until you get to that specific point. But that specific point will never happen. Yeah, it that, won't. There's always going to be something else. Yeah, the hedonic treadmill. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. If you, but by the way, there's something... There's something useful to that, right? If you if one thing doesn't satisfy you and you keep needing to, you know, go on to the next thing in order to uh, feel happy, that's how a lot of progress is done. Mm-hmm. From you know, from a certain perspective, right? Mm-hmm. If you if you look at society in general, for example, that doctor who then tries to become the surgeon and then from surgeon chief of the hospital or whatever, mm-hmm. something along those lines. Mm-hmm. You can argue, I mean, that's that's progress in a way because that person, even if they're not necessarily feeling happy in their own personal world, right. there is some sort of progress being done there as far as like in terms of society and survival. Right. But I mean, I don't think it has to be that way, which is kind of the purpose of this talk. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Um, I could see its uses. Like, wh- why are we like that by nature, right? To to sort of try to keep, you know, never being happy and trying to go on to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Oh, you know, have you guys ever seen the movie Cool Runnings? Cool Runnings? Yeah. yeah. Liz, With have John you seen Candy? it? Yeah, I think cool. Do, oh, do you remember there was this really great scene in the film? So I don't remember the name of the characters, like either one of them, but there was this really great scene with, you know, the the dude who's the athlete, Leon. So the actor's name, I don't know his name in the film. So him and John Candy. And so he's like, so John Candy, kind of a quick background. Um, so he's pretty much this disgraced Olympian who obviously was this famous bobsledder at the time. And then he ended up cheating for a second gold medal. And then they ended up finding out, blah, blah. Right. So they have this great scene where, so John Candy comes into the room. And so the, Leon's character, whatever his name was, is like, hey, you know, like, he's a coach, man. He's like, why'd you do it? He's like, I don't understand. He's like, you had so much fame. He's like, you had the respect of all of your peers. He's like, literally, he's like, you pretty much had anything that any athlete in our sort of field or domain, whatever, would want. And he's like, why would you do it? Why would you cheat? And so the sort of the line of the film, and I think like one of the best lines in the film history, where he says something along the lines of, he's like, look, man, he's like, if you aren't enough without a gold medal, you'll never be enough with one. Wow. Right? I yeah. love that line. Love that line. And that's, that's what excellent. I think, that's like the sort of downfall of the Donna treadmill. So uh, I like your point, Alan, when you said that, you know, sort of achieving and um, kind of striving for more and sort of looking life as a sort of competition in a sense is a good thing, right? Well, it's just, it's just, I'm just trying to talk no, about no, I agree with you. the way yeah, they no, are. No, no, I agree yeah. with you. That's what yeah. I want to say. So like, I totally agree with you there. But I think the problem is that when we infuse our self-esteem into it. So it's like, if you already feel like shit about yourself and you're like, you know what? Like here, like what Liz said before, right? So I got this thing that I was looking for and it didn't really do anything, right? So now John Candy's character is like, I want a second gold medal, right? This is the thing that's going to make me happy. And that didn't do it. So then the question is literally, if you're not going to feel good about yourself achieving these things, right? If these aren't the things that are going to make you feel good kind of um or are going to make you feel like you're finally a worthy or valuable person then i think that literally raises the question of what will well yeah i mean for me um i've had i had this one point in my life in my early 20s Mm -hmm. 
don't have to get into too many specifics, but I'll say this. I, I had a, a lot of money mm-hmm. at one point. So I was able you were to, rich? Once a, not exactly, but I definitely was able to buy... Seize whatever. the moment exclusive. Yeah, I, I went from not having to being able to, to buy anything I wanted, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Uh, back then, you know, I was into like... Well, I still love video games and stuff like that, but I was like right. really into that. I would buy this sort of equipment, that computer, that TV, this thing, that thing, all of that. And like, yeah, every time you buy, yeah, it's like you press the little dopamine button mm-hmm. and like, yeah, sure, I felt good the moment I bought it. But then having all these things as opposed to not having them, I realized like it didn't do anything to like how I felt about life in general. It's not like it had anything to do with what was really real, like the connections to people around me, my friends, my family, like your your bonds with people and things like that. Like it, that stuff wasn't really affected by just the having, yeah. right? And like even if I did have, it's not like it really subcommunicated status the way I thought it would mm-hmm. because because once I became dependent on those things kind of speaking for me mm-hmm. right it didn't it didn't have that effect because people aren't really affect I mean on some level some people will respect if you have a bunch of things they will yeah but also on another level they really don't because if that's all you have to offer I mean the person who just happens to be more interesting in an interaction or just real authentic yeah. would have more status mm-hmm. and it's and, and it, it, by the way it's not about status i'm just i'm framing it this way from the competitive uh, mindset just to that kind of person if they're watching right. like from a competitive mindset like you didn't even look like you were so high even if you have all those things yeah uh from a then what i learned is that it was how i felt was more tied into like my thinking mm-hmm. right yeah into um whether I was in my head, like trying to control a certain situation to look a certain way or to dominate or whether I could just kind of let go mm-hmm. and see like how another person is feeling, like how, let's say you are feeling mm-hmm. or how Liz is feeling and yeah. stuff like that. And kind of like just have a, and really care about what you're saying and just listen and yeah. have a back and forth instead of like, for example, you know how some people listen to say something yes. that they, they're just, they have something canned that they want to say. So they'll wait for you to finish or they won't and they'll just talk. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another way where you just completely listen to them and you actually respond to what they actually said and you fully listen to what they're saying. Take the time to think about it. Yeah. yeah. And so, Liz, how come you think the hedonic uh, treadmill isn't as effective as people think it would be? That's a really good question. Uh, it it really depends on, on, your, on your mindset. Can you be satisfied with what you have right now? Mm-hmm. And... It's it's two different things. I think the hedonic treadmill, one is you always in competition with yourself. Uh-huh. And it just feeds off of your own ego, right? So when you're in competition with yourself, you're also really asking people to give you the kind of affirmation that you're always kind of running and striving for. But that's never going to happen, right? No one is going to give you the perfect amount of affirmation. You're like, okay, I'm satisfied. Yeah. I don't need to keep trying that hard. It's yeah no it, I, mm-hmm, go ahead and I think with how complex and busy the world is and how image focused it is now and how how that has changed uh, it's all it's it's gotten a, I feel like it's gotten a lot worse and especially it's gotten a lot worse with Gen Z yeah. and that kind of uh, image and appearance is worth a lot more capital than anything it's intrinsic and that kind of thing it's it's very toxic it kind of it kind of rots you out from the inside yeah so it kind of seems like what you're saying is that when it comes to self-image or i guess when it comes to public image that the hedonic treadmill is kind of like fraudulent in a sense that you're kind of um you're not necessarily achieving a particular i guess outcome or a particular goal in the sense of like whatever the goal is in itself but you're sort of achieving a goal in the sense of what it kind of projects to other people as being that i guess my major point is that it seems like kind of behind the surface that the thing that people think that you have or the thing that you think that people think or rather the thing that people think you've attained is actually not the thing in itself maybe that's why that it's so unsatisfying in the end what do you think let's yeah well i'll I'll say this um (laughs) so what's funny is 
Well, all right. So I've had times where I've gone into a certain venue, right? Mm-hmm. This is, we're talking like years ago. Mm-hmm. Let's say I go into a train. I'm on the way to college, mm-hmm. right? And I used to get in. And I'd be, uh, you know, you get, you sit down, there's all these people, all that, and you're kind of looking at the person across from you, or you're, or you're not, you're trying to look at the ads and all that. I think, like, as New Yorkers, we can all mm-hmm. kind of relate to that. Mm-hmm. And so, like, what would happen is, though, that I, I would have uh, anxiety, right? I couldn't uh, even turn my head to the person to the right of me. I would try to look anywhere else, mm-hmm. but, like, at them, right? And, you know, from a certain perspective, like, you could just be like, no, well, that's just anxiety. That's f-. But in another way, it's, a com- it's actually kind of a competitive mindset, too, it, because I'm looking at how I look in relation to them. Yeah, you feel inferior? Uh, or you felt? Or, or whatever it is, because I couldn't even really, um, yeah. I couldn't really reason it. It was just, I would just automatically have it. Mm-hmm. But you could say that, sure, maybe it's an inferiority thing. Right. So the thing is, like, when I would think like that, I was so in my head. All my resources are, like, into, like, how do I look? Or how, how is this person looking at me? How, what are they thinking right now? All this kind of stuff. Really weird. Well, not weird. I'm sure it's normal from a certain it's definitely perspective. Common, yeah. Sure. But I'll say this, like, it definitely, like, in hindsight, it feels very strange. Mm-hmm. Because there's another way where you could just sort of just be there, sit, relax. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can do an activity on your phone or read a book Mm -hmm. or just sit there and relax. Mm -hmm. And like there were these things that like I I wasn't aware that I could just kind of switch my focus to. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel easy at the time, though. Of course, it's sort of like a different conversation as far as how you get out of that. But like the moment I sort of would uh, go into the environment and kind of assume that everyone there is is it's like we're all on the same team Mm -hmm. like they're all my friend for example or a potential friend Mm -hmm. it was a very different sort of a mindset uh, as opposed to like oh everyone here's foreign like i'm this little isolated island versus other little isolated islands Mm -hmm. or like i'm competing against these people or these are my enemies or i don't know who they are and all that Mm -hmm. it was like just coming from a different place where i could kind of merge with the environment so to speak yeah well you didn't feel like an outsider yeah, mm-hmm. and it's very funny that, you know, uh, from one way, uh, from the competitive mindset, yeah, like, you might strive for things to look a certain way, you might appear, so you might, like, for, let's say, on days where I wore, a, like, a really nice outfit, mm-hmm. like a suit or something, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and it was, it was like, whoa, it's so sharp, mm-hmm. right, and it looks cool <laughs> and all that, mm-hmm. like, sure, maybe on that day I would feel fine mm-hmm. in the competitive mind frame, you know, mm-hmm. but what was interesting is, like, then let's say I didn't, then I'd have lulls in the way I would feel, mm-hmm. and it's like, is you know, do you really want to live like that? It's like really not a great way to live, it sucks, because your just emotions keep going up and down, up and down. And they're context dependent, mm-hmm. pretty yeah. much on yeah. the environment, yeah. Yeah, but then there's another way that's not really dependent mm-hmm. on the environment. Mm-hmm. It's It could just be dependent on... Your, where your focus goes, mm-hmm. for example. Like, whether you, you know, you uh, listen to music, you get into a flow state that way, or if you meditate, or if you just have a certain understanding about the world, you mm-hmm. know, if you just have a mindset, like, everyone here is on the same team, yeah. or they're just like me. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're thinking some of the same things I would think. Mm-hmm. So I really shouldn't be, you know, so anxious or whatever. I think that that's a great remedy for it. And especially in the context of zero-sum thinking. So if we think of zero-sum thinking, again, kind of going back to the concept that it's one person versus the other, then, I mean, yeah, if you feel like it's kind of second you step out of the door, you have to compete with literally everybody in your environment for whatever, right? And that's the thing with zero-sum thinking. It's so silly because even when we come out of the house, we feel like we have to compete with people, even though there's really nothing to compete for per se in that particular moment. But I guess maybe that's not true. Maybe you're like competing. I don't know for who's like the best looking or the best dressed or whatever it is and it feels like again if one person is like let's say do you look sharp or and if another person let's say maybe looks less than then it's like oh this person looks good and this person looks bad so maybe I think that that's the way we could be thinking of the world Were you? so you know so here's the thing mm-hmm. if you if you are behaving from that frame mm-hmm. and you are competing like let's say me mm-hmm. right okay <clears throat> so Got a gut, mm-hmm. balding, okay. right? All this kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And like not so tall. I'm not, I'm not short, but I wouldn't call myself tall. Like it's not six foot something. Height, yeah. I wouldn't say a little above average height. Okay. 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 Sorry. <laughs> hey man, competitive mindset just came in. No, I'm just mm-hmm. fine. So like, 
<laughs> what should I call it? Um, yeah, and then compared to like the six foot whatever chisel jaw, all that. Mm -hmm. If I came from the competitive mind frame, then of course that person wins because mm -hmm. we're trying to go like, what do you have versus what do I have, and what's like this? What do we socially value, right? right, right. Yes, yes. But it's funny. What's funny is if I come from a collaborative frame, there's none of this like dense ener this dense reactive sort of a re energy that I might have to this person yeah. where I might be able to act in more of a authentic way and maybe it'll be just sort of like a behavioral based thing mm -hmm. who comes up. So here's the thing. I don't really care who comes out on top like status wise, yeah. but just as an example, say somebody has is just looking perfect, right? Mm -hmm. But you're coming from this collaborative frame. Yeah. You could still, um, I, again, this is not the purpose of this, but you could still outshine them from a behavior perspective. Mm -hmm. That's not the point of it. I'm not trying to put that message no, out to you. the audience. Yeah. It's not about outshining or looking higher or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if your behavior is on point, usually that's what matters. Usually that's what kind of subcommunicates that status mm -hmm. because you're just very comfortable in the environment. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't be comfortable if you're coming from, you know, I need this condition or my condition versus that person's condition doesn't, you know, they're winning or something like that. And right. then you have a lull in your emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you're pretty much you're kind of in control of the way um, you can be perceived. Is that it? I actually I feel like when you let control let go of control mm -hmm. of how you're perceived, paradoxically, mm -hmm. it's a better perception that you get. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's the end you should be seeking right. by letting go of it. It's mm -hmm. like this paradoxical thing. Somebody who's in a competitive mindset might use this as a tactic, mm -hmm. right? But then it would stop working because you're gonna fall back into the competitive mm -hmm. mind frame. Yeah. You could try it if you want. Yeah, but. there's a difference between being quietly confident and just being arrogant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? You step too far, you get into that arrogant kind of territory, and that's a turnoff for most people. Yeah. But that kind of reserved and quiet confidence really helps people gravitate towards you. And you can get to a point where you, you quiet your mind and it becomes a lot easier and you don't have to, uh, there's some effort you have to put into it initially. And then after that, it becomes very natural. Yeah. And, and people, uh, people can, people can sense that off of you. It kind of radiates off of you and yeah. people in, intrinsically pick it up. So. Yeah. And Liz, I'm wondering, cause obviously you've been like to other places of the world. So in terms of the yeah. competition and sort of cooperation, what is it like elsewhere? Do you feel like, like America is sort of uniquely competitive? You know, we are a highly individualistic culture, but there are other facets of competition, particularly in Asia, that are incredibly cutthroat and incredibly stress-inducing. Yeah. Uh, when I was thinking about the concept of competition before, the first thing I thought of were the Gao Cao exams. Mm, in what's that? China. Mm -hmm. It's like the it's like the Chinese version of the SATs, but it's brutal. And you know, there's there's so many high school students that sit down to take this exam and a very, very minute fraction will get accepted into universities. Mm -hmm. That's how you go to college. You wow. have to do well. Mm -hmm. And you could be you could have straight A's, but so do millions of other people. Wow. And this is really and you this is really a make or break because if you don't get into that top university, you can't try again. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to, you know, you might have to resign yourself to working in a factory or even staying on your, you know, on your family's farm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a wheel. You're, it's a real, you're either a winner or you're a loser scenario. And to have this pressure put on teenagers is, it, it, it makes a person crumble. I mean, I can't imagine that kind of stress. But, yeah. If, wait, you, wanna, so, if you want to hear competition on steroids. If, wait, so yeah. what ha what happens to them then? So, like, what happens to the kids who don't get into the schools? Factory jobs, she said. Oh, my, my bad. I missed that. Oh, yeah. wow. Factory jobs. You could do, you can find your way into a third-rate university, but you're not going to get a good job after that. Or if you're rich uh -huh. and you don't want to sit for the Gao Cao exams, uh, your parents will pay to send you overseas to go to college. Wow. But 
That's if you're rich. Uh If you're not rich, the gal cow is really the only way for you to propel yourself further in life. And if you don't do it, that's it. There's not another chance. And so it seems kind of that what pretty much we're saying is that essentially the society creates or doesn't create a zero sum culture. That's correct. Yeah. Wow, man. Holy shit. Yeah, there's certain societies where it's like, yeah, there's, for example, to think in um, a collaborative mind frame, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be it could be helpful with how you network and stuff like that. Maybe to someone living in in China, it's in well, actually sorry, pardon. The Gaokao exams are in China, right? They're in China. Yes. Yep. Okay. So so someone living in China maybe thinking from a collaborative way is helpful in terms of yeah making relationships and yeah. things things of that nature. But uh, yeah, there's things like that that are very cutthroat, and that's a reality. Like you have to realize that life can be very uh, competitive could be very uh, cruel at times could be very you know again if it's this make or break sort of situation right. i mean it is it is what it is right in certain uh, societies and like yeah highlighting it and talking about it maybe um it would lead to some sort of a change right but um if that's the current reality i mean you have to accept that and you know work within that framework or I have a pushback against that. Please, right? I mean, because look at the Hong Kong. I love pro- that. <laughs> look at the protests in Hong Kong. I mean, that's you. That's the point, right? Because it is such an unequally distributed society, which is why these kids are rising up. And technically, Marxism. And oh, okay. I know. I don't want to make this a political podcast. Good, no, talk about yeah. whatever you want. Yeah. So okay, fine. So Marxism is pretty much bastardized by Chinese communists, and I really, really want that to be clear for our audience, because a lot of times, especially in America, it's very difficult to distinguish between what is sort of actual Marxism, right? And what is kind of totalitarian communism, right? And whatever conception that is, whether the Soviet Union or whether China. So the point is that when you look at the actual Marxist text, so what they're doing in China is not Marxism, right? So we're not talking about these people who some people win and some people lose, or some people pretty much, let's say, based on kind of, you know, their upbringing, their tutoring, um, kind of maybe even, I don't know what the schooling is like there, but maybe even the type of education that they received, that they were the ones who were able to sort of get through these exams and maybe through other kind of factors that I'm at this point obviously unaware of, that they're able to get, you know, these sort of cushy jobs and everybody else has to be a factory worker that is not marxism first of all marx hated factories he said that pretty much common workers were alienated in those factories and he would have been horrified by the communist by the chinese version of communism so i want that to really be clear and so also the other reason why i bring up marxism is because if we're thinking about this in the context of society and so we're saying that hey look to some extent that yes life is competitive right so we're saying that in some situations it's zero sum that let's say if alan and i are competing for a girl right let's say hypothetically that yeah chances are that she's gonna pick one of us absolutely so in that case it's <laughs> alan's pointing to himself <laughs> <I'm just joking. laughs> he's probably right so no, 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 he's really a better joking. human being no, 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 no. <laughs> okay okay go ahead with the <laughs> so essentially what we're saying is that in some situations it definitely is going to be zero sum and that's inevitable so when like let's say if that were to happen and the girl would say hey no look i prefer alan over you you're gonna have to look elsewhere buddy and i'd be like okay i understand so in this case alan wins i lose but the point is that for most of life what if she chooses both of you at the same time that's actually true. That's, that we very, both, that's a yeah. very 2019 <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> yeah, so okay, fine. The framework that she's coming from is important too. But my point is that like, as a society that we can actually mitigate those zero-sum situations. That's what I wanted to kind of impart. And it, just one last thing. So, And I think with Marx, right, and not to make this obviously a sort of um, an advocation for socialism, but the point is with Marx, he pretty much said that we shouldn't have a society that's zero-sum. That, and I don't know exactly if he said this but my sort of conception is that like look we have to as best as we can as a culture to mitigate that so yes in some instances zero sum is sort of kind of um it's not preventable understandable right but for the most part if you have a society like china where literally if it's if the contrast between winners and losers is that stark like it's becoming increasingly in this country like there's thing there are things that we could do to fix that right we shouldn't have a society where literally you have sort of like this sort of um this uh i guess 
tiny hodgepodge of the rich people on the top and obviously everybody else is poor. That zero sum that I think is a complete bastardization of what society is supposed to be like. But if we're talking about obviously what America was supposed to have been, where like you had, I don't know, let's say the upper class paying something like 70% in taxes and then you have a great, you know, sort of stable middle class and then obviously some people are probably inevitably going to be poor. Whatever that means is, I don't know, different to different economists. But the point is that we can have a more egalitarian society whereas we mitigate the zero sum situations. Or not mitigate, we re- reduce them. We reduce the amount of them. But the point is that Alan is right. I definitely agree with you that absolutely there are going to be some cases where we do have to accept them. But I definitely also think that as a society, we have to do our best to make sure that we reduce them. That you don't have people who pretty much are in these situations where literally one test, one fucking exam changes the entire course of your life. That's insanity. Yeah. That's insanity. Yeah. yeah. What were you going to say? Well, what I was going to say is that in America, as far as like consumer culture is concerned, yeah. Um, thinking in zero zero sum ways uh, to be in that competitive mind frame is actually very useful to yeah. marketers and advertisers mm-hmm. because they'll just sell you something to, that'll make you have higher status relative to another person and that sort of drives consumer culture. It's also like that in politics too. Yes, someone will just you know get you to be you know you versus them, like mm-hmm. left versus right. Alt left versus alt. Oh right. God! Whatever. I got gotcha. you. Know. I got gotcha. you. I feel you. Yeah. Uh, Republican versus Democrat. All of that. Right. Right. And um, in yeah. It's so that's the thing. Like this kind of thinking drives a lot of uh, people mm-hmm. and gets people to be um, well, gets people to try to manipulate others, and also they get manipulated by people who you know play on this level. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it, it works, it works, right? But again, it's not the best for like, as far as how you, um, feel individualistically, maybe it works like, you know, from a, a higher order of things where you look at society and like, no, we, we need this way of thinking in order to, you know, keep the economy alive or something yes, like yes, that. Yes. Or we don't know any other way. So if the, it would be chaos otherwise, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I, I don't know, actually, because I'm not, you know. Well, Liz, you have a poli side background. What do you think? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that puts you on the spot. No, we're... Oh, God. Well, we you know way dead. more about this stuff than we do. That's why I ask. <laughs> way more. Well, if we're talking about... Uh, the recent, the the relatively recent developments in this, uh, in this uh, schism in political thought, mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of bipartisan cooperation, uh, and, but then that started to diverge in the early seventies. Mm-hmm. Uh, coincidentally, at the same time that lobbying was really first introduced to Washington, and initially when lobbying started, it was to give other minority groups a uh, louder voice in Congress. So it really began with uh, women's movements, uh, you know, like feminist organizations. The lobbying started for them because they were underrepresented. And then lobbying slowly became hijacked when it was really all about money and special, you know, other special interests. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of just gotten worse from there, uh, which now we have this kind of cutthroat, situation that we see today Mm -hmm. where just recently uh you know our president said don't look at the democrats as our opponents they're our enemies Mm -hmm. and that language is is very telling um yeah if you're gonna put if you're gonna put that kind of competition between other citizens where let me put it to you this way. Now they're like, you know, marketing t-shirts that say, get over it. You like, you know, you lost. We're all on the same team. We're all in the same country. It really shouldn't be a half of the country wins, half of the country loses situation. Mm. Uh, in terms of kind of civic participation, and really the greatest kind of sense of collaboration we could possibly have, which is uh, our participation in democracy. Mm-hmm. That is slowly declining as well, and it has been declining uh, since, I want to say, the 80s. In uh, 1995, uh, there was a political scientist named Robert Putnam Mm -hmm. who wrote this article called Bowling Alone, and it essentially meant it was, it's a, 
talking about other people's social capital and how social capital has been declining. Oh, and wait, 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 Liz, I have a question before we continue. What is social capital? Okay, so social capital can be your kind of interpersonal relationships, your societal mm -hmm. status, uh, really just where, where you just kind of stand in your community. Like, basically, how many people can you fall back on mm -hmm. in your community? Your status, pretty much. Your reputation, right? Your status, your reputation, mm -hmm. and also uh, just your, your, your friends and your, and your family around you. Gotcha. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that uh, so that was incredibly collaborative. Uh, you see a steady decline of uh, you know people in civic organizations, religious participation, all of that uh, across all the decades. And, and when people talk about now is uh, you know how like isolated people are and how they really can't connect to one another and they're all very kind of like self-absorbed, mm -hmm. people will automatically jump to social media and social media is definitely uh one of the reasons but civic participation has been declining for some time and when he wrote bowling alone he put it in the frame of bowling leagues and mm -hmm. bowling leagues used to be incredibly popular mm -hmm. but now people aren't in bowling leagues anymore <laughs> they're bowling alone yeah. all by themselves and uh so he goes through a different different reasons why we became kind of torn apart from each other and that subsequently means that there's a, a, a weakening in the fabric of our democracy where we really don't come together uh, as a team and and push our best interests forward it's a very uh individual every man for himself kind of situation yeah yeah we we take ourselves and our viewpoints very seriously and that keeps us separated from people around us mm -hmm. you know and it's like the it's only the the people who can embrace sort of not taking themselves so seriously, mm -hmm. kind of letting go, who can sort of be able to form relationships with others. Mm -hmm. And what sucks is that um, this trend of us um, distancing ourselves from each other, sort of bowling alone as the you know title of the article, yeah. mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, that's... that's uh, it's because of all this um, marketing, like you versus them, mm -hmm. that, that kind of mentality. Yeah. But the thing is, it's like, uh, I don't know. Does it have to be that way? Mm -hmm. What? Do you th I mean, it, it is that way, but do you think it has to be that way? Do you think there's another order uh, that we can sort of follow where mm -hmm. maybe we can sort of get along but still accomplish the things that get accomplished from the competitive frame for instance like for example when trump says like uh <clears throat> let's say trump says you know the democrats are our enemies right mm -hmm. so I i'm always skeptical when a politician on that level says things of that nature right because mm -hmm. i'm wondering what's what's he getting like what's he trying to do right because i think he knows the impact his words have especially since he's been in business for many years mm -hmm. he knows that it's going to be something that's that's like a button push yeah. for like anyone who is uh, a democrat and anyone who is a republican on one level uh the people who are republicans would be like oh uh any, anyone who falls for that kind of no, right, dialogue right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um they would all sort of uh rally to whatever you know whatever cause he's espousing and all that right. and it's like a technique right mm -hmm. for anyone who falls for that technique yeah. and there's yeah. probably a reason that he he uses that sort of language yeah. unless you think it's really off the cuff because i know he's an off the cuff kind of a guy yeah as far as that goes so but i feel like politicians use specific language for certain purposes right like just to push on certain buttons. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Well, about I actually that? wanted to touch on if that's okay with you, something you said a little bit earlier, which I think relates to this, but you can stop me if it doesn't. Oh, so okay. We can switch. Up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's kind of, no, it relates. I pretty, cause you said us versus the mentality. And I was thinking when you said earlier about how, when you used to come out and you would think about, Oh man, like, you know, I have to compete with the people that I'm sort of around. And then you said consciously, but that was, the, yeah, that but, was basically the behavior. But yeah. then you said you changed your framework, right? And it became kind of like, um, where you felt like everybody was a collaborator or a friend to you right is that what you said yeah i would i would just assume familiarity yes and so why i wanted to touch on that is i think that's so important in terms of the question that you asked right does it have to be us versus them and so just to kind of you know sort of go aside from politics for a sec i think that it doesn't and here's why so in terms of like behavioral therapy we have this idea of acting as if 
So acting as if just literally means like even if you don't believe that something is true, just try it. Just try to act as if something like that is true, right? Or something that you want to believe is true. So an example of this is um, let's say if you believe that the, let's say being a procrastinator is inevitable. You're like, oh, I can't get anything done, right? No matter how hard I try. I would say, okay, how about we try one day, just one day you acting as if like you can maintain a schedule for that particular day. Just see what happens. And of course that person is going to say, no, I can't. And I'd say, okay, but let's try. Let's just see what would happen. Like, like you, a thought experiment. Yeah, like a thought experiment. Like, just to see. You don't even have to do it. Just try. Try to see if you can act as if. Right? So, And sometimes what would happen is the person would be like, holy shit, I'm able to do these things that I was so sure I couldn't do. And so what I was thinking about it is in terms of your framework of like the collaborative framework. So what I actually found was that so much like Alan, I was actually in the same sort of, um, I guess, state where I literally believed that as soon as I kind of came out that everybody was judging me or that in some way I had to kind of compete against them or whatever it was, right? But then like, I don't remember like what the trajectory of it was or how I came to this point. But like, and I was telling Alan you the other day that like I started just for whatever reason treating people as if like I knew them like random people so like people would maybe come up to me and say something or like I would start a conversation and I would literally start talking to that person as if I'd known them for years yeah. like they were just a friend and like I've got crazy good results from it and so people are super receptive to it whereas before I would think my and this is uh, like just an estimation. I'm not sure how true this is. But I think looking back on it, I thought that people who did stuff like that were like just crazy. Like why? Like how do you just approach a stranger or just talk to a person like that? Like they're going to think you're a nut job. And so, but I just tried it for whatever reason. Again, I don't remember why. But so like now when I talk to people, like whether it's kind of just random people at work or when I just run into like the UPS guy or something on the elevator, I would just randomly talk to them as if I'd known this person for my entire life. And the conversations are phenomenal. Like, like these people literally sometimes tell me stuff that I would like never imagine that they would have yeah. told me because I'm like I don't know this person and you kind of find that like from in terms of what Alan said earlier that when you change the perspective from me versus these people or us versus them that when you look at these people or the world as just this friendly place I'm not saying it's even supposed to be but if you act as if as if people are genuinely friendly and want to get to know you and treat them such, you can get some amazing results. Yeah, somebody would be very surprised by those results. Yeah. For example, when I first learned about that mindset mm -hmm. of, um, you know, you assume everyone is your friend, mm -hmm. it was very foreign to me yeah. when I first heard about it, mm -hmm. right? But then, like you said, I acted as if it were true. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, and I have that attitude with a lot of different things, especially if something new. Um, a lot of times, especially if somebody I respect suggests something, even if it's foreign to me, I'll try to take it on as if it's like one of my beliefs and like just see how it works. Mm -hmm. It definitely worked yeah. for sure. Um, I wouldn't, we wouldn't have uh, met probably or we wouldn't have uh, talked mm -hmm. for example like say i just okay so me uh and leon we met at a barbecue yes and for example say i just stuck with the friends i already knew mm -hmm. right and it's that comp it's that competitive mindset like oh i'm just gonna st stick around where people know me where i have status right mm -hmm. i'm not gonna go to this a person here who doesn't know me mm -hmm. who can judge me in all this sort of different ways right like i guess i could think like that right right but instead uh, we found we started talking about psychology mm -hmm. i think at mm -hmm. some point which is interesting i don't remember exactly how it came up mm -hmm. but then like we got into a flow with that mm -hmm. and then we would just hang out more often mm -hmm. and eventually the idea to do the podcast came up and all that but if uh, there was no collaborative frame there for example none of this would be we wouldn't have had some of the great guests, including today, that we have, you mm -hmm. know, and like be able to talk about all the different kinds of things that we're able to talk about. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. If we were still th like at times, I'm sure I'm sure there's times where we fall back into competitive thinking. Yeah. But say this, say we had that kind of thinking in relation to our views for episodes. right? <laughs> yeah. For example, we had um, awesome guest uh, for episode 23, mm -hmm. uh, Napoleon. Yeah. Right now. What did, so, you know, one person might think, wow, like uh, a, a guy of that caliber with so many uh, viewers on all sorts of platforms, you know, as soon as we have that episode come out, should have, it should blow up, blow up. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. If, if you, here's the thing. If, let's say you entertain that thought and you were dependent on that happening, right? And yeah. it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't feel good, Right. But what if, but then if you didn't feel good, what's the trajectory of that, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's like, but what's the purpose of the show? Like, I start to think like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the purpose of the show? It's just to, you know, talk about certain topics that, like, you feel like people 
one would like to know about because it's not widely accessible mm -hmm. or just things that you want to just share, right? Yeah. And learn about. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about it, like from that mindset, it goes back into collaborative. Yeah. From the competitive, yeah, we could be looking at views and all that, but I feel that it, that takes away resources from like what's the most important point of doing the show. Mm -hmm. But then again, yeah. you should be concerned with the metrics, right? You want to see how you're doing and all that. You have to be, you have to think many different ways if you want to yeah. have some sort of success. You can't just be like, I'm just offering value, you mm -hmm. know? If you're like that, I mean, a lot of people would just then have businesses that wouldn't make any money, yeah. right? They would, or maybe they wouldn't be a yeah. long-lasting, sustainable business. No, you because, have to, yeah. yeah, you have to be able to receive and think about things like that. It can't be just like all like give, 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 yeah. right? Um, one thing I wanted to say also is Shoot. just a practical example. Shoot. Say, um, say we're all hanging out, right? Mm -hmm. And Liz says a joke mm -hmm. about me, right? Mm -hmm. And like. <laughs> And I let's say I get offended. Yes. Right? Uh -huh. That sounds like you. No. <laughs> That's wrong, actually. But say I got offended, right? Right. Then then, I, then we wouldn't get, be having Did a you just time. get offended by me saying No. That. I didn't. Still collaborative. Thing. See, it works. It works. Now here's the thing. So what would happen is say I was, I would be coming from that collaborative sort of mindset. No, no, sorry, I'd be coming well The competitive. Yeah. I'd be coming from the competitive because yeah. Uh, oh, this joke, you know, oh, he offended me. Oh, this is like not in line with my identity. It's not who I am. I'm going to start to react and all that. Mm -hmm. And then where would that take the conversation and the whole flow of things? Yeah. It would probably dull the energy, you know, of just the interaction. Uh, everyone's, you know, emotions would kind of go down because one person is being all serious all of a sudden, mm -hmm. right? But if I take it as a joke, mm -hmm. I laugh. Maybe I'll be like, Yes, like you know how you improvise, you'll say yes and whatever it is, since we're just being general here. Mm -hmm. If I take that approach, the whole course of the conversation might be way better than the, the, the I hate to use the word energy, but it works. <laughs> I get it's you. fine, it works. I get you. The energy of the interaction would be heightened, everyone would still be having a good time. That's and true. also, when you're able to take a joke, too, it's also it also sub communicates status as well. You shouldn't necessarily think about that. Right. I don't recommend anyone to think about that. But just for fun, for our competitive listeners, mm -hmm. if you say that, mm -hmm. they'll be like, oh, okay. And then they'll actually try it. Mm -hmm. And then it'll still work out that they'll eventually learn to be collaborative. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I have a question for both of you guys. And I want to first point it to Liz and then Please. to Alan. So okay. do you, what do you guys think is the sort of middle ground between the two obviously extremes? How do you sort of merge the two concepts together of competition and collaboration and create it in such a way where obviously you can have both ideals satisfied? If it's even possible, you think? Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hear you. I'm I have an answer. Okay. Liz, well, you want to go first, Alan? Yeah, I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Shoot. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, when we started this podcast, mm -hmm. I mean, did, did I want to be looked at, uh, along with you, did I want to be looked at as someone who's like this all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, as uh, Emmy said in one of our episodes, like uh, somebody who has... Ancient, I'm sorry, was it Ancient Secrets or oh, something like well, that? Like she, when she was Someone talking, had like... Well, just, I, was, I just want to kind of give Liz a quick background. So when we had the psychologist Emmy Van Dersen on, so she, so my, like one of my clinical idols, his name is Artie Lang. And so David Tenenbaum actually, by the way, guys did a recent film about his life called Mad to be Normal. I, you guys would love it. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So, but the point is that Artie Lang was like the super narcissistic dude, but the thing is like, he was absolutely fucking brilliant. So Emmy actually knew Artie. Well, his name is Ronnie. Um, so she said that pretty much whenever like Ronnie kind of went anywhere, he had followers with him as though he were like like a sage right yeah. like you were like a guru and so the thing with him was that more so than kind of um in terms of collaboration and competitiveness more so than sort of learning from other people it seemed like what was so important to him was actually just being this sort of all-knowing kind of wise sage what's That's funny what. though is he still got results no he did even from the competitive mindset yeah and he still was revered as a genius, but in his interpersonal relationships, yeah. he had a lot of fallouts, right. as I understood it from he did. how Emmy framed it. Yeah. And that was because he, you know, would view himself as higher than or lower than in certain situations. Right. And I just want to be also clear that he was wrong about a lot. Fair enough. Yeah, but a lot. So, like Freud. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing mm -hmm. is, like, yeah, like... Do, did I want to come from that frame or do I want, uh, like, or for example, I don't know if you want to come off that way. Probably no. Mm -hmm. Like this all knowing person, like who's 
this uh, who just has all these this knowledge to things that other people don't yeah. or are you just like a like or am i let me put it this way am i a dork and everyone else is a dork mm -hmm. right and we're all kind of dorks mm -hmm. right and we're all just kind of trying to figure things out mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now here's the thing for me i think it's a balance between yeah like there are things that you know you want to be uh powerful you want to be effective in the world you want to have like for example as far as a uh, production goes like a great podcast, mics and cameras and lighting and all that type of stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I do care about that stuff working, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I want to be coming from a place where I'm enjoying what mm -hmm. I'm doing. And then uh, people can feel that. Right. And it's real and it's authentic. And it's like, um, and I think that's where the balance is. Like, you still, you come from a collaborative frame, but you're, you're also realistic in the sense of like, no, I need you know, this thing to work well, I need that thing to work well, you you should know what you're talking about, you can't just like, uh, I mean, you can riff, it's a podcast, we can just riff, right? But I don't want to talk about a certain topic and sound like I know what I'm talking about if I really don't, yeah. right? So of course, I'm not going to do something like that. Right. So it's it's like this this balance between um, like just being authentic and seeing or trying to be authentic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, like again, that's also trying to sound like you're it is, somewhere it is. up yeah, here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, to the best of your abilities, be as real as possible, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and then also at the same time, try to be competitive in the sense of like just uh, increasing. Uh, how well you do like a business or a project or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if we need to know something about marketing, mm -hmm. for example, while doing this thing, yeah. am I just not going to learn it just to be authentic and just be someone <laughs> who's, you know, uh, giving and a dork and like, oh, I'm just like you, you know, o or will I try to find, you know, somewhere in the middle of the balance to that? I like I, that. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Liz, what do you think? Okay, I, I, I drew a diagram. Oh, uh, <laughs> I love that. Is that okay. the three of us? <laughs> yes. yes, this is, this is uh, me, you, and Alan, uh -huh. right? And so uh, these like inner spheres would be our personal and professional goals, right? Right. Us essentially being in competition with ourselves to do better, Okay. right? And then this outer sphere are our overarching goals for the entire group. Mm -hmm. That's how you can combine the two. So I right now during this that. podcast, mm -hmm. uh, I'm you know trying to not be nervous and string coherent sentences together. Mm -hmm. You guys have your own opinions about stuff. But all, <laughs> all three of us have this overarching goal to have this be a good episode. Yeah. So this is both individual and collaborative. I fucking love so, that. You know what else I love? Yeah. I love the Yoda. The, what's oh, the, oh the, <laughs> I didn't even notice that part. Oh wait here. <laughs> what does it say? Oh do or do not. Yeah, my my to do reminder list. Oh, that's so cool, uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said no. That actually makes sense. So it's like in some way what we're doing is we're looking at ourselves. Ooh, this brings me back to the episode with Jamie, right? So what Jamie said in the episode that we I think it was like episode six or something so far back. So she said something along the lines of like individual success doesn't really exist, right? That we're all sort of connected with one another in some way. So I think kind of what the way I'm interpreting what Liz is saying is that when we're sort of achieving things individual individually, right? That is sort of part of the greater whole of what we're looking for in terms of our community. Well, it definitely contributes to the greater whole mm -hmm. in the community. Just the thing is some people would be under the impression the, dif the difference, the distinction there is that some people might be thinking that they're in competition. Right. Right? Even if they're, uh, from a higher perspective, not. Yeah. Right? So, uh, but still, yes, they are essentially still part of a whole community contributing to, yep. you know, the greater whole, for sure. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's maybe the only way to think of our podcast. Because technically, in some way, we are in competition with people. Because, like, we know that. No, you, here, okay, hear me out, Alan. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. This is why I think we are. Technically, listeners' time is definitely valuable and it is scarce, right? So people aren't going to sit and listen to 20 podcasts in a day. So technically speaking, we are competing with listeners or for listeners with other podcasts. And there are millions of 
podcasts out there. So look, I'm saying that it's possible that let's say we can have one or two people, whatever it is in terms of the views and the audience, and some of them will say, hey, I like three podcasts, right? And these three podcasts, we could be involved in. Great. But what I'm also saying is that in some way, we are also competing. What do you think? Okay. So uh, shoot. you said technically we're yes. competing, right? Uh huh. So if you're saying technically yeah. we're competing, then technically I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> Okay. But I'll say this. Uh, um, <laughs> but I, like, I don't feel like I'm in competition with the other uh, podcasts, mm-hmm. um, and I think that's important to not feel that way mm-hmm. because it's just gonna dilute what message you have to. Because here's the thing: if I'm thinking about um, us in relation to Rogan, for example, right? Oh, I'm not doing that. But yeah. say, say, okay, yeah. or um, I don't know, uh, Tim Ferriss podcast yeah. or Jocko Willink. Or Aubrey Marcus, or Jace. Oh, I don't know. I See, Alan Jason is Silva's all knowing in terms of podcasts. I know a bunch of podcasts, <laughs> right? Now, here's the thing: like, if I felt like I was in competition with them, mm-hmm. that would just dilute the whole message, like that we're trying to put out there. Right. It's weird. It's like if I was really trying to see like our audience versus their audience, mm-hmm. and like trying to get their audience or something. I don't know. It just hurts my head to even really think about. Right. Um, I get it from like a. I mean, I think you, uh, realistically speaking, yes, you're right. Like they have an audience and maybe somebody from that audience could be listening to our things, our yes. stuff. But I feel like there's so many different people in the world. That's true. And then you just get like whoever will listen to your show or listen to what you have to say or even people you meet in life who will like you and that you'll like back. Mm-hmm. It's all about like just resonating with them. And I feel like if you just resonate with people and co- are concerned more with just your message and then whoever it resonates with it will just kind of flock to you or or you'll flock to them you know vice versa yeah uh if i think you genuinely have to give a shit yeah yeah Mm -hmm. you have to there you (laughs) go that's all boils down to to any kind of interpersonal relationship Mm -hmm. is you just genuinely have to care yeah if you don't then it's I think authenticity is really the number one thing that most people should strive for yeah. in their personal and their professional lives and in podcasting. I mean, the best podcasts that are out there are like the hosts like genuinely care about what they're doing and they don't seem that preoccupied with their competition. Mm-hmm. They might have a niche or something, doesn't really matter, but the, the most impo- enjoyable podcasts that I listen to are just really people just doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just being as real as possible. Like Rogan, for example, his mystique is he's just genuinely curious about a whole bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. And then when he just had more experience doing podcasts, then he just had guests that he was really curious about. The reason why his conversations were so good is because he's asking things that he really genuinely wants to know about. Mm -hmm. And then that's why he can sit there for three hours with somebody. I also... I like the three-hour style, by the way. I hear you. I know. I don't know. I would like to do it one day. I hear you. But, yeah, I'm putting it out there into yeah. the ether. <laughs> but, um, I hear you. Well, my, my, Liz, my thinking... It's not today. Yeah, but, my, my <laughs> thinking is that nobody's going to sit through a podcast for three hours. So, that's, that's my But you'd be back. surprised how many people sit through no. organs. Hard, hardcore history, each episode is like six hours long. What? I don't have that kind of time. I know how other people... You don't. Yeah. But some people may. Okay. Yeah. The world is just... There's so much variety out there. Yeah. It's not even... It could be the person who actually... You might think it's somebody who's not working, right? Mm -hmm. For example. Yes. I would think that right off the bat. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. But not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Could be somebody who's just like legit rich and just this hanging out at home and they have time to mm-hmm. and then they're like genuinely interested or well, something like that. I know the people that listen to our show pretty much listen to it either on the train or in the car. So, there you go. Yeah. Liz, when do you listen to podcasts? On the train when I'm commuting. Yeah. yeah I fa- how long is your commute? Like two hours or something? An hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to it at home too. Oh, do you? Yeah. Okay, I hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Like right after work, I'll put on like a pot, uh, I'll put on also a radio show. Like mm-hmm. I like a uh, uh, it used to be Opie and Anthony, yes. but now it's Jim and Sam, mm-hmm. whatever. So I listen to that. Um, Aubrey Marcus, Rogan. Rogan's a big one. Mm-hmm. I, a lot of people connected to Rogan. A lot of different comedy podcasts. Yeah. Tiger Belly, Bobby Lee. There you oh, go. Bobby Lee, I know. Bobby yeah, Lee, yeah. I know. So I listen mm-hmm. to a whole bunch of different ones mm-hmm. and even, not necessarily just on the train. Actually, on the train, I'll read Yeah, uh, usually because... Mm-hmm. Uh, I find it hard to like once I'm home, I want to just kind of relax and listen to something. Mm-hmm. So I'll 
you know, read on the train or whatever. But that's just like neither here nor there. Just I hear you. Extra info. <laughs> All right. We covered a lot of ground today. I mean, we still have some time. Anything else you want to talk about? Um, let's see. Alan has like a whole list in yeah, front of him. Yeah, a whole... Like two, two, two full pages of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Alan came prepped. Hmm. Well, I just noticed that like when you're trying to kind of control things and you're in this kind of competitive mindset and you need to look a certain way versus, uh, you know, in relation to another person, it's just like this uh, sort of denseness to like, there, there's something that's happening there between you and another person. It's like this filter yeah. that's blocking connection between you and them. Yeah. Um, and I feel like when you take away that filter, yeah. you just think that they're just like you and Thing, things like that, it opens up like for a real, um, you know, bonding to occur. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? Um, the philosopher Theodore Adorno, uh, his name is Theodore Adorno, he once said that the um, sort of uncertainty is the mark of the authoritarian mind. And so the people who do, by the way, try to control, it seems like they're kind of, um, they're obviously kind of very greedy and very sort of, um, very kind of vain and sort of trapped in narcissism. But also the thing with control is that a lot of times, right, it's again, the scarce mindset. We go back to that again. So a lot of times, like when you see this in sort of relationships, right? Um, and okay, I hesitate to kind of broach this topic because this is like so, so kind of charged, but I do think it's important. Unfortunately, it's not really it's not a great topic for like now, especially at this time for the podcast, but I do think it's important. Um, so like for people who struggle with domestic violence, right? So a lot of, I know super like, no, no, no. yeah. So a lot of times with the people who are sort of the abusers, right? These sort of high level narcissists, it's because they have like, they are super controlling and they do have a fear of uncertainty, but they also have a very scarce mindset where for them, it's like, if I don't possess this particular person, I will never find anybody to love me ever again. And so if even they believe that they, can be loved right and that's a whole kind of other issue so but the point is that when it comes to control and of course there are levels of this right sort of we try to have control and influence over our lives all of the time but the point is there are certain people that are so sort of or feel like uncertainty is so intolerable and that sort of the world is so scarce and when it comes to zero-sum thinking for them it's distorted right so like remember what we said before that zero-sum thinking is um well so in some cases it's accurate right sometimes it's not so when it becomes a cognitive distortion is when zero-sum thinking is generalized to the whole of life. Mm -hmm. So we view the whole world as a win-or-lose situation, right? We're kind of like in China, where like if I'm not the sort of winner, right, then that means I'm going to be the loser. And so you have these people who are super authoritarian, right, whether let's say politically or in this case in their relationships, because they literally believe that if they don't possess a particular person, there's no way on the face of this earth that they'll ever have another sort of, um, let's say, another girlfriend, wife, whatever, ever again, that this is it for them. And they have to maintain control because if they don't, obviously they're going to be the losers and it's never even about the other person it's about their self-esteem it's about feeling like if life is a zero-sum competition as a whole if the world generally speaking is this sort of dark and dense sort of you know um, dense and sort of gloomy world right then i have to make sure that i'm on the better side of things that i'm on the side of let's say the people who have rather than the ones who don't mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so just just a thought just an idea no 100 percent that's um, very good yeah yeah uh, I mean, I, I come from a background where competition, mm -hmm. and a lot of people can relate to this, where competition is the norm, mm -hmm. right? And again, like, to, to a lot of people, it might look like the collaborative frame is a sort of like delusional fairy world sort of mentality, re reality, uh, maybe on the surface, like just from that perspective. They'd be like, oh, yeah, not everyone works with each other. Not everyone can work with each other, all that. They might have arguments along that line, right? right? Mm -hmm. But... I, and I, by the way, if somebody thinks like that, I actually encourage that. I really think you should question um, the collaborative frame mindset. If you think it's delusional, I think you should question it. I would question if you didn't think like that, actually. Right. Well, right? I, would, I would think but, that any extreme is delusional. Uh, right. Yeah. And I, But the only reason I'm saying that mm -hmm. is just because I'm not trying to push like one way is correct versus another way yeah. it it sounds like it and honestly like personally i prefer the collaborative frame but i know plenty of people who be who behave from the competitive frame who i who i just love yeah they're some of the best people let me tell you yeah and honestly it's completely fine it's the, the just the thing is just um there's pros and cons 
to the competitive frame versus the collaborative frame. And I feel like yeah. it just the main thing to take from this is to be nuanced enough to know yeah. when to behave from the collaborative frame. I don't want to say and when to behave. From no, the I lo- I frame. actually agree with you. Uh, here's the thing. Here's, here's the why. thing. I feel like you can acknowledge certain competitive things, mm-hmm. right, without necessarily behaving from the competitive frame. Because again, mm-hmm. you're you're too dependent on. It's too reactive, like that kind of mentality. I hear you. But do people? Does it work? Yeah. And are some of the best people coming from that frame? Mm-hmm. And could they just have lined up all the circumstances in their life to always kind of match up with how it is they're trying to control the situation, right. so that they they behave in a way that still um, jives with how other people interact with them? Yeah. It works. Like it does work. Some people just are lucky with the arbitrariness of uh, how uh, circumstances work out even to for somebody acting from the uh, competitive frame. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, again, somebody could be like really rich, have everything on point, mm-hmm. and just all their interactions are on point. Right. So they never have to have that lull mm-hmm. because everything is perfectly orchestrated and controlled. Mm-hmm. And they can be also good people too. So it, I'm not trying to say one frame is better than another, mm-hmm. uh, but... Uh, I tend to like the collaborative one more. I, I feel you. like you, you, it's not dependent on certain circumstances. Yeah. Liz, you had yeah. a thought? Yeah, I'm thinking about how I used to be incredibly hyper-competitive. Yeah. And it it was incredibly self-limiting. And it also gave me a lot of agita. Like, I was miserable yeah. when uh, I was either, like, a very competitive in school or video games or even like a you know i'm writing this this sci-fi book and i would i would get into these like funks and blocks where i was like well i want this to be like the greatest sci-fi book ever <laughs> like i'm gonna uh i want this to be published i want you know i want to get like a million dollars and then i would just be like well you know what it's not gonna happen because my writing is garbage and oh, i should wow. just like stop now but you know, that's because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this incredibly lofty and unattainable goal and that it's actually stopping me from doing something that I enjoy, yeah. which is writing sci-fi. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, I just, you just have to enjoy what you're doing just for the sake of doing it. Yeah. And for me personally, a lot of that came with like getting older mm-hmm. and just being content with my, uh, you know, current station, my current abilities or lack thereof. Mm-hmm. And just not taking everything so seriously. Uh, Hyper competitiveness really, you know, it can, it can maybe give you a slight light more of a leg up or give you more visibility professionally, Uh but it's not going to carry you. And there's no point in being the best if you're going to be miserable. Yes. It's not. I have, I have two thoughts there. So first Liz, I know your abilities, at least to whatever extent it's possible for any other human being to know another person's abilities. And I actually do think that you can achieve those things. So I really, and you know that we do, we've had these conversations before. So I do think that you can. So, and I don't think that you should put them aside like all together. And here's why. So I actually think that a balance is the best thing to do. So in Mm -hmm. terms of like, let's say, so the key word that you said, Liz was very competitive, right? And the thing that Alan was talking about before, which I did agree with, which you kind of back tracked on was that like you know striking the balance between the two may be important and so what i think is that like everything has its sort of place right so in some cases i really do think that it's okay to be competitive but to also have a more nuanced understanding of what that means and so an example of this would be like let's say if alan and i were playing a video game right or let's say oh because i don't play video games fantasy football right so for us in our league we like fucking hate each other so (laughs) then we have to kind of take a step back and really examine what it is that we hate each other for right so so, like, let's say if Alan and I were competing this week, right? And obviously, their game's going to be on soon. So, like, and let's say I beat Alan, right? And I'm thinking, like, oh, my God, like, this is amazing. Like, I am the best. Alan, I beat you. You suck. You're terrible. Blah, blah, right? So, in that case, I'm very competitive. And I'm coming from the framework of literally sort of winners and losers overall. That in terms of zero sum, right? Now, I am the sort of winner of life. And Alan is the sort of loser of life. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense. So, it's it's completely irrational. 
But if we were to put that in its proper context and say, no, 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 I technically did beat Allen this week, right? And yes, part of it was luck, absolutely. And part of it was literally skill, right? So like, let's say I beat Allen because I picked the best sort of team, right? And his team was obviously worse. But then also there was luck because maybe one of Allen's players got injured. Um, let's say maybe sort of one of my guys, oh, maybe sort of another one of, um, okay, so this is like a lot to, kind of a lot to explain. But let's say maybe one of the wide receivers that I was playing, let's say was a number two receiver and the number one receiver went down and then all of the targets went to my guy. So the thing is I can say, wow, you know what, Alan, I'm so happy that I beat you, but I also understand that there was a lot of luck in this. So I'm not saying that I'm... Nobody better. says that. <laughs> no, I know, nobody, I know, I know, but it's reality, right? So the point is, it's like you put competition in its proper context where you would say like, look, I'm glad that I received this thing. And yes, in a sense, it's not that I'm happy that you didn't, but I'm happy that I did, right? But it's, <laughs> right? But it's also to say, I understand that it could have easily went or it could have easily been otherwise. To say that competition in itself doesn't define the person globally. That just because I beat you in something, whether video games, fantasy football, whether I got a job and you didn't, it doesn't mean that I'm better than you. It might not even necessarily even mean that I'm smarter than you and probably doesn't. What it means is that like, yes, in this sense, I did better, perform better than you, but there was also a lot of luck involved. Okay. And also check this out. What's up? If my reaction mm -hmm. was to be quote unquote butthurt from mm -hmm. losing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be me <laughs> coming from that yeah. competitive frame, right? right? But what if I wasn't upset, right? Mm -hmm. What if I'm just like, hey, he won. It's the game, right? Mm -hmm. And we're anyway participating in this fantasy football thing, which is like a, a, a group building sort of. A, it is. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you bond with the people that you're, you know quote unquote competing against but the competing is coming from a place of like this is for fun yes right uh, ooh that fantasy football well boy. here's the thing when you take it very seriously we all do though that's, <laughs> so that's what I'm saying when you take it very seriously and then yeah. identify with that yeah and then have you know certain conversations with people where like it sounds like oh okay uh, the team I identify with won over your team, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. You can speak like that, right? Mm -hmm. But then say the way I took it is like, oh, yeah, you know, and then like it's still we're having that sort of line of dialogue. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as I don't get, you know, uh, offended by it, it's still all in good fun yeah. as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. And like you should be able to talk like that. Why not? It's like... It's something that we just do, right? I hear you. and But the thing is, though, if you talk like that, I think that's cool. And that also has its place. But you can't actually believe it. So here's the problem. And this is what used to happen to that's me. That's the nuance. Right? Yeah, it yeah. is. And this is what used to happen to me. So like when I'd win a fantasy football game, I'd be like exhilarated and over the top. And I'm like, yes, I'm the best. So like in our league, right? And I'm going to brag right now. I am a five, four or five time. No, I think four time champion. So like I was like, oh my. And everybody's like, bro, you're like a dynasty. You're amazing. And then guess Guess what for like the next three to four years i didn't even make the playoffs so i was pretty much devastated by this because i was on the high high thinking like i'm pretty much like one of the greatest fantasy football players ever and i really believe this and then i went <laughs> yeah i really did and then i was like on a low low where i was like yo oh my god i'm awful and it was all bullshit and it's like none of it actually mattered and it was just pure luck right the point is that if you we're talking about self-esteem and self-image none of those things are fucking true not what i wasn't one of the greatest fantasy football players of all time and even if i was it doesn't mean what I thought it would have meant or what I thought it did mean. And I certainly wasn't the worst either, right? But the point is that sort of it's a combination of skill and luck. And sometimes like in poker or another, any other game, like sometimes things go your way and sort of life helps you out. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you build a team. Oh, and here's the other thing. Sometimes in drafts, like, um, so, oh, right now I'm horrible in my league, by the way. So I'm two and four. And according to my draft, I was supposed to have been one of the best players because I drafted really good players. But the thing is, life is such that you can't really necessarily predict predict who's going to be the best or who are going to be the best players. So kind of just the whole point of this, obviously not to ramble on about fantasy football. Yeah. So, but the whole point of this is sort of to put competitiveness and competition in its proper place to say that, yes, it takes skill and absolutely there's definitely talent and ethic and work ethic involved. No fucking question about it, but there's also a lot of luck and there are also a lot of opportunities that you may have had that other people didn't. So it's not so much of I'm better than this person, but it's like, no, and th on this particular day, like, let's say I had more skill or more to offer than this particular person in a particular domain but there were also other factors that made it so that's it yeah uh, so, Sam, Alan, i think that you should pull yourself up by your bootstraps to become a better fantasy football player i agree that's right it's yeah time. more study it's definitely water. time more study <laughs> yes. um so one thing is uh just another example True. say i'm in a i don't know let's say i'm in a nightclub mm -hmm. or something like that 
You? Yeah. <laughs> and say I am talking to some girl and a guy comes by and all that. And right. This guy, uh, back to that example I gave even earlier, mm -hmm. six foot five, chiseled everything, mm -hmm. right? Now, here's the thing. If I was in competition with him, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would just kind of be psyched out, right? I'd be like, oh, okay, whoa, this guy is here, and da da da. And then, like, it would kind of, uh, then I'd kind of uh, get myself out of the conversation somehow. I'd just probably, like, self sabotage or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, not just that, it would put some kind of weird energy between me and the guy. Mm -hmm. Whereas, let's say I was coming from some sort of a collaborative frame, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe I would, the guy comes in, right? And I'll be like, oh, hi, you know, like welcoming, mm -hmm. let's say, for example. Right. Um, and then get him into the conversation. And then we're all talking mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to even think about competition or anything like that. You see how, like, when I framed it before, you're automatically thinking, like, oh, he's trying to get with this girl. And my the other girl. person comes in. It's, <laughs> and then all this and all my emotions are affected by this interaction. Right. The other one, it sounds like, oh, hey, another person's entering the interaction. Hello, welcome. We're all talking now. It didn't even come to my mind to think anything here. And you see how, like, if you imagined how one interaction would go to it's like 10 minutes from then mm -hmm. and the other one 10 minutes from there, mm -hmm. you can probably guess that the it's going to be a, a whole different world of interactions. Right. I would have made a new friend, mm -hmm. would all be just talking, interacting, and it's a good time, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and I, why did I give that example? I just want to give something practical instead of like to being all theoretical. I hear you. Um, I think fantasy football example is great too. That's definitely just, practical, bro. Yeah. No, I'm, kidding, I'm, kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, it's not. I was only kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fly, Pelican. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. It's time to wrap our things up. All right. So, final questions, thoughts. Alan, Liz, what do we got? Mm, Liz, what we if we wanted to, if we wanted to, let's say, follow something that you do online, where could we follow you? Nowhere. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Audience, take that down. It's okay. If ever in the future yeah. there will be something, we'll definitely post and attach it to the yeah video. Well, wait, Liz. I do have a question. Like, uh, yeah. where are you in your sci-fi book? In where terms am of, I? Yeah, where are you in terms of writing it? Like, how beginning, middle, end? Middle. Okay, cool. It's coming yeah. along. Okay. It's getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Can I ask what yeah, it's about, or is I'm, that weird? I'm taking a vacation next month, and I plan to churn out uh, the rest of it. So, fingers crossed. That's really cool, man. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, what, what's it going to be about, like, just to give a little bit of something? <laughs> Unless you're like, hey, man, I'm not ready to, like, talk about it. Uh, I would, uh, on the surface, I would describe it as an adult version of E.T., Okay. Ooh. Wow. Mm. And uh, yeah, there, it's this kid with uh, in a in a poor home situation who's extremely agoraphobic, mm -hmm. and he ends up uh, teaming up with his uh, school psychiatrist. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this should be an interesting like story. <laughs> to help right. out this alien. So there it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Final thoughts for our audience. No, just uh, thank you very much for watching. See you guys next time. And Liz, thanks again. Thanks so much for coming on, dude. Thank you for having me. This has been great. See ya. <laughs> See ya. Bye. All right. All right. That was good. That's it? No, no, no. <laughs> I know I was a like, guys, if you, wanna, if you wanna follow us, please follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook mm -hmm. and on Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast mm -hmm. on Twitter. Yep. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs>